Uh, Ivo Buurma. Dank u wel, dank u wel. It's great having you here. If you say everyone can do something, what do you think lawyers could do? Um, what, what society, what, what our species needs lawyers to do is, is I think really pretty straightforward at the broadest, at the broadest trope. Um, the, the, the fact is that, we'll talk about this more, but to make the energy transition from our current uh, emitting energy system to a, a net zero emitting energy system during the course of a, of a single generation is going to require um, unprecedented action by governments and really all aspects of society. And the thing is that, that we don't have many institutions that are tailored to this kind of a long generation scale effort. Mm -hmm. In particular, uh, people in executive and legislative branches of government face re-election every few years. And so there is incessant and repeated um, uh, a temptation to succumb to sort of temporal free riding and suspend action so that you can reward constituents in some way over the short term. And because the legal system and the judiciary in, in particular is structured around evidentiary standards, there is a way to, for the judiciary to maintain the effort to okay. be the sort of backstop for humanity against the inevitable tendency to shirk and free ride. Okay. And so humanity needs every lawyer to educate him or herself about this issue so that they can uh, engage in that effort and okay. will forever be grateful to those who do. Okay, that's, that's the first lesson you learn, you, you teach them. <laughs> they have to focus on this big issue, climate issue, the, the environmental nexus you talked about. Now, you know that at this moment there is a big case in the Netherlands, the Urgenda case, um, in which um, the government was thought to be liable, or you could better say it, 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 it was ordered to do more than, than, than that they did before. Um, my question to you is, how do you, what do you think about the urgency of reducing these carbon emissions uh, in, from this perspective? So from a, from a scientific standpoint, um, it is clear that the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are dangerous and that are already um, causing considerable harm for humanity. And so wisely international processes that led, for instance, to the Paris Agreement have identified um, targets um, that are consistent with um, a, a sort of a practical uh, 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 barrier against harm. And the most stringent of those, the aspirational targets from the uh, Paris Agreement, would have every industrialized society um, go to essentially net zero greenhouse gas emissions, that is, eliminated at all, mm -hmm. uh, around uh, 2050. Now, that's not that materially different from 95%, for instance. Right. We now have alternatives to our emitting and industrial, uh, in, uh, our emitting uh, energy and industrial technology and agricultural technology, which we can use that lead to no greenhouse gas emissions, the complete, their complete elimination. But to do this in a practical sense, what we need to do is to replace our infrastructure yeah with non-emitting infrastructure, which we have in hand, we know how to do it, when the, not, when the emitting infrastructure wears out and becomes obsolescent, right? That's the way to keep costs manageable. And that means that from here forward, every time a, you know, an emitting power plant, for example, wears out, we should be replacing it with non-emitting alternatives. Yeah, right. And so now is the time when delay really starts to matter. The good news is it is practical to change our energy system for a non-emitting one over the next 30 years. The bad news is that now procrastination is really going to cost us 
okay. by creating new energy emitting, or by, by creating new emitting in, infrastructure um, that we'll have to contend with at a time when we need to be replacing it. Okay, that's clear, that's clear. Now, of course, there are all kinds of, let's say, economic problems involved with this. I mean, it's, it's the difference between growth and green, you might say. And, and maybe we could change the subject a little bit to issues of biodiversity, one of the, the pillars of, of your environmental nexus. And if I just think of how some entrepreneurs in the Netherlands are thinking about it, they say, look here, now we can't build a road or, or do something else which is necessary to do even. We can't bring something about to conserve nature because there is one of the 707 species of salamanders that should be protected. And, and, and then you might ask, well, I, I can imagine that with these huge issues, climate and environment is more important than growth. But should we really be always that specific in, let's say, these biodiversity issues that you will always say economy is less important than environment? So I think it's very important, uh, and I will address the issue of biodiversity um, uh, in just another two or three sentences, but I want to uh, reaffirm that for climate change, I do not believe that there is a conflict between economic growth and climate mitigation. We now have the technology that is roughly cost comparable to what we have today that will solve the climate problem. And so we have an imperative responsibility to implement it. It is even possible that we'll receive extra economic growth if we adopt these technologies early and lead because we can, for example, export them. So I think that with climate change, and uh, the problem, there is no conflict with economic growth. Mm -hmm. Biodiversity is a different matter. Uh, again, uh, th the, I think we need to draw a, a distinction between a, um, uh, an Endangered Species Act that prevents a road to save a salamander and the action with the, uh, which I believe was about nitrogen pollution for the 18,000 yeah, right. units that you just talked about, right? Yeah. Nitrogen pollution, uh, has a couple of different forms. And make no mistake, nitrogen pollution hurts people directly. Nitrogen emissions into the air, fossil nitrogen emissions into the air, actually kill people. And nitrogen emissions into the water pollute the water. And when they escape, they, they, um, they poison ecosystems. And when they escape into the ocean, create anoxic zones and other problems. So nitrogen pollution is, um, is much more like greenhouse gas pollution than it is like the endangered species problem. I think it's actually a simpler, a, a simpler uh, 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 issue ethically, at least. Um, on, the, on, the, on the issue of whether or not we should stop a road to save a salamander, unfortunately, that depends ultimately on aesthetic and ethical uh, judgment that mm -hmm. will differ among people. Okay. And so I think this is a case where you really have to leave it up to voters. I know I love salaries. <laughs> <laughs> have since I was a kid, right? I, I remember when I was uh, young, there was a, a developer who had been prevented from building a golf course that was going to cost $200 million to, to develop because it would make a butterfly species extinct. And he wrote a, an influential article in a national magazine that had the refrain in it, what is more important, a butterfly or a $200 million golf course? And it had absolutely the opposite impact. Effect. <laughs> because everyone who read it said, well, of course, the butterfly. <laughs> That's great. Thank you.